Good afternoon, and welcome to Sunday Sessions Online. I'm glad you have joined us today. I encourage you to get your Bible and get any other items that you need for taking notes, because we're going to have a wonderful time together today in the Word of God. Let's get right into it. I've titled this message, Exceeding Great and Precious Promises. Now, the past few days, I guess just hearing so much Christmas music, I've been thinking about this Christmas song, The Twelve Days of Christmas. I've always wondered what that song means. Does it even have any meaning, frankly? And so I decided to find out. I heard that song many, many years ago, and when our boys were young, we had several Christmases when we let them open one gift each day starting 12 days before December the 25th. Now at first, the boys thought this was a cool idea. That was until they found out we were going to pick which gifts they got to open. And then they found out these were going to be the really small ones. And um, then they told us that a new pair of socks was not that exciting. But anyway, we had a lot of fun with it. I had the right idea. However, my timing was wrong. And I'll explain that. Many years ago, the church, the church world, thought of Christmas as a season and not just one day. I suppose that changed with the uh, merchandising of the holiday, so much push to sell things, and probably parents didn't really want it to be a season. But anyway, the 12 days of Christmas actually started on December the 25th, and they went through January the 5th. I always thought of it starting 12 days before Christmas, but in that I was incorrect. Now, between 1558 and 1829, Roman Catholics in England were not allowed to openly practice their Catholic religion. So someone, and we don't know who, wrote this little song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, and it was an attempt to teach the basics of the Catholic beliefs to their children. This song is actually a real mixture of a few good ideas and some really messed up theology. Uh, it's quite interesting, frankly, and I have no idea why they chose the things that they chose to represent what they represent. But this is what the song means. My true love and the partridge in a pear tree represents Jesus. The partridge, because that is a bird which will sacrifice its own life to save its children. I assume, though I didn't find this anywhere, that the pear tree must be some kind of reference to the cross. The two turtle doves represent the Old Testament and the New Testament. The three French hens are faith, hope, and love. The four calling birds are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The five golden rings, that's the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. The six geese a laying, that's the six days of creation. Seven swans a swimming. Now, here it gets messed up. In the Catholic religion, they think of the Holy Spirit as seven gifts. That's the way they talk about it. And it is not by any means what we call the gifts of the Spirit, of which there are nine. You may or may not know that, but Paul was quite clear in his writings about the nine gifts of the Spirit. But they call it seven, so that's what they did in the song. The eight maids a milking represents the eight Beatitudes. Like I said, I cannot figure out, I don't understand why certain things represented other things, except maybe for the first one. Then we have another mix-up. Because the nine ladies dancing are supposed to represent the nine, they call it the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. Well, in Galatians 5, there are nine 
things listed as the fruit of the Spirit, but those are the fruit of the human spirit and not fruits of the Holy Spirit. The ten lords a leaping is the ten commandments. The eleven pipers piping are the eleven faithful apostles. The twelve drummers drumming are the twelve points you find in the Apostles' Creed. Whoever wrote this, uh, wow, I think they were absolutely trying to hide what they were singing about. But the Catholics in England sang this song publicly for over 200 years, and the Protestant rulers of that land had no idea what was going on. Now, I'm not making this stuff up. You can find several articles about this on the Internet written by several different people. And I'm not making fun of the people who wrote this little song. I'm not making fun of the Catholic Church. But I do have a serious question. How is this helpful when you face a difficult situation? It's good information if you want to play a game of music trivia, I suppose. But it only feeds the mind. It does nothing for the spirit of man. When we're facing tough times, our spirit is constantly searching for something to take hold of, to sustain us, to get us through whatever we are dealing with. So I want you to consider this contrast, and you'll know then why I introduced the message the way I did. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, "...whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, think about this. Every time you lay hold of one of the promises of God, you take that promise, you claim it, you stand on it, something you may have never been aware of is happening to you in your spirit. God is not only keeping His promise, He is changing you to be more like Him. You are partaking of God's very nature when you stand on these promises. Think of it this way. God keeps His promises in order to have the opportunity to cause you to be more like Him. I think that's really cool. God is more interested in keeping His promises to you than you are in having Him keep them. Now, as I was talking to the Lord about these really weird, strange times we're living in, I asked the Lord what I should talk to you about today, and these were His words. Go back to the basics. Go back to the basics. Break it down into some of those exceeding great and precious promises that I made and talk about those. And so, as I worked on this for several days, two different lists emerged that I'm going to share with you. The first list of promises were all given to us by Jesus as He was speaking to the people in front of Him during His earthly ministry. Now, I am by no means going to cover all of the promises. I just picked out a few. The second list of promises expresses strong thoughts about our future. Some of this is personal, and some of it is to the church as a whole. So, I'm going to start with the promises given to us by Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, this world is a very dark place. It has been since the fall of Adam, and it will stay that way because of sin. But Jesus has promised us light in the darkness. Eternal life is essential. Eternal life takes care of the ultimate future. 
But we have to live here on this planet for an extended period of time, some longer than others. And the only way to do this successfully is to have this light of life. And while others around us are stumbling in darkness, we can see the way to go because the light is always shining brightly. This is a promise. Expect to never be in the dark. And if you find yourself there, or if you feel like you're there, then look for the light, because the light's always shining. John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. There's a lot of people right now, their hearts are troubled, and they're afraid. And they're wondering about what's coming and what's going to happen. Jesus said, I'm giving you peace. Now, you make a decision. You choose to not let your heart be troubled. You choose to not be afraid, but you do it based on the promise that I gave to you, that promise of peace. There's no peace to those who don't know the Lord. We know that. They may act like it, but there's really no peace. This is why they say the things they do. This is why they come up with the crazy things they come up with. This is why they believe the stuff they believe. is because there's so much unrest on the inside of them. Their ideas are wrong. So much of the time, they're wrong. They lead to something worse than what they thought they were going to solve. But while things are going crazy around us, we can live and abide in this peace and our hearts never need to be troubled. I know that's a bold statement based on recent events. I know that, but I'm basing it on a promise Jesus made. And the more I lay hold of that promise, the more His divine nature is transferred to me, and the more that peace is a reality in my life. John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free... Ye shall be free indeed. You may or may not know, even though slavery ended in the United States, officially, there's still a lot of slavery in the United States. It's perverse. It's horrible. It's terrible. But there's a lot of slavery in other parts of the world too. From a natural perspective, a lot of people are not free. And there are people right now right now as I speak, trying to figure out more ways to rob us of our freedom. But more importantly, there is a freedom in Jesus that absolutely nothing can take away. John chapter 14, verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Wow, that's huge. Jesus has chosen to include us in deciding what will happen in our lives. We are not puppets. Of course, God knows what is best for us, and none of us would argue with that, but we have been given this wonderful promise that what we ask the Father to do in the name of Jesus will be considered as though Jesus had asked the Father to do it. And this puts us on a much higher plane than a lot of people seem to realize. Now, all of this is going to get richer the further I go. But can you see, are you getting an idea of what it means to be partakers of His divine nature? Walking in the light He walks in, having His peace, knowing His freedom having your request honored by the Father as though Jesus Himself had made them. You are becoming more and more like Him. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not neither knoweth him. Yet you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. 
Now, Jesus kept the first part of this promise by sending the Holy Spirit to the earth a little over 2,000 years ago. But He continues to keep this promise every time another person receives the Holy Ghost. And now that's millions and millions and millions and millions of times that Jesus has kept this great and precious promise. And I assure you, I absolutely declare to you, the number of Spirit-filled people, the number of people who walk in the Spirit, the number of people who speak in tongues, the number of people who pray in tongues is going to rapidly multiply in this nation and around the world. It is happening and it will increase. The Holy Spirit is not only here, He dwells in us. Talk about having His divine nature. Wow. The Holy Spirit will abide with us forever like He has with the Father. But He's not just with us. He is in us. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. There it is again. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. There is more than one promise in that passage. I will come again, Jesus said. I always say in response to that, and today would be a good day. Been saying that for a long time. I'll keep on saying it as long as I'm living on this earth. It's always amazed me. How many people believe in God, but they really don't believe in Jesus? I've observed that much more frequently than I care to admit, but a lot of people, a lot of people believe in God. But that's where it stops. They know about Jesus, but He's not the Lord of their life. They believe in heaven, but they're not doing what is necessary to spend eternity in heaven, the place that Jesus has prepared. We have mansions waiting on us. I know, I know. Some of the translations, they want to change that uh, to rooms and that kind of foolishness. I'll stick with mansions. We're going to live like God lives in the same splendor and the same grandeur in mansions. Mark chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. For verily I say to you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and you shall have them. Now while we talk about heaven, and we dream about the life to come, at the same time we have many challenges in this life. But Jesus gave us both a revelation and a promise concerning our words. This is another example of what I've been talking about. We are to live, to think, to speak to our world just like Jesus would if He was here on this earth and we could see Him every day and observe what He was doing. Now, frankly, I don't really know how people live who don't know these principles. I really don't. Their, their lives must be in constant turmoil. Because what I just read to you has changed all of our lives. Probably every single person that's listening to me, you've heard those verses many, many times. This is a daily way of living. It's that kind of a promise. And we use it constantly. This promise does not mean that we can just shape our world any way we want it to be. Here's a very clarifying promise that we have to take into account. It's John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now the promise is you can bring forth much fruit. 
But then there's this little phrase at the end, for without me you can do nothing. Now, some people might think of this as restrictive. Without me you can do nothing. But that's also a promise. And I find it liberating. I am never on my own. Never. It is always Jesus and me. No matter what I do, He is a great part of it. And I really like that. Now, the last one in this group of promises that were given to us by Jesus is in fact His final words before Jesus went back to heaven. And these are another wonderful, wonderful promise. But then immediately after Jesus says what He says, then the angels spoke the rest of this and they delivered another very significant promise about Jesus. These words were spoken about Jesus as He was ascending back to the Father. It's Acts chapter 1 verses 8 through 11. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now stop right there for a moment. Jesus had already promised to send the Holy Spirit. Now He has instructed this group of people in what they should do. And as He ascends back to the Father, He says, you're going to receive power. Wow. We know the fulfillment of that. We've witnessed it. We're a part of it. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And today, what I'm doing right now is bearing witness to the truth of these promises. And this is going into multiple countries all over the world. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? Now verse 9, And when He had spoken these things, while they beheld, He was taken up. His last words on this earth were an exceeding great and precious promise. The Scripture goes on, And a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. That's how real angels are. They could only distinguish them by the white apparel. And they said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Boy, I love those words. This same Jesus. Now, I have my own ideas of what Jesus looks like, what He was like over 2,000 years ago when He walked this earth. I'm not an artist. I don't draw. can't draw you a picture of it, but I have a picture in my mind. And probably you do too. But one day we're going to see Him, and we will see Him as He is. And then all of our questions will be answered, and it won't be something that we wonder about anymore. We will know. John recorded another promise. And I'm using it to connect this portion of the message with the next one, where I'm going to be talking about other promises that come through other people. Here it is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are you the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Wow, what a promise. I could build a whole sermon around that one, but I won't do that now, I don't have time. But what a promise. We're going to be just like Jesus. It will be so clear we have been partaking of His divine nature all of this time. See, I really believe if there's any surprise when we see Jesus the first time, it will be that we realize just how much we have been like Him all these years, all because 
of these promises that he's given to us. There are close to 7,500 promises that God has made which are recorded in his word. I'm not even scratching the surface. I'm just giving you a few of them. I picked out these because of what they've meant to my life. And you probably have others you want to add to your list, and, and that's great, and I encourage you to do it. Now, for the next promise, I've chosen to use the NIV. I don't use it very much, but this is one place where I think they are more accurate, frankly, than the King James. This great verse says a lot. It was not only God speaking to Jeremiah, but He was speaking to us as well. Jeremiah 29, 11, from the NIV. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. A promise of hope. A promise of a future. Wow. What a great promise. Now, I want to suggest, because I'm going to read some more here, I want to suggest that you take these first five promises, that one from Jeremiah and the four that are going to follow, and you couple those together. And I think you're going to see, even though they're coming from five different writers, that there's a connection between them. Let me repeat Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Joshua 1, 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. James 1, 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. Psalm 37, 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Can you see how these verses paint a picture of how God desires to work in our lives? He wants us to succeed. He wants things to go well. In fact, He knows how to make them go well if we'll just listen. A lot of believers right now all across this nation, other parts of the world. Uh, wow. They're looking at things and they're wondering how things are going to work out in the weeks ahead, in the years ahead. I know that. I hear a lot from a lot of different people. Remember these promises. Believe them. Use them. Saturate yourself with them. Partake of His nature. It is these words I'm sharing with you that would determine what happens to Pastor Donna and to me. Not the media, not the politicians, not the crooks, not those who've committed fraud, but the divine nature that lives big on the inside of us. These promises from the Word of God will never change because God does not change. Here's a few more. Psalm 34.10, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Isaiah 43, 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle up on thee. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, 
which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If I could change what has happened in the last few weeks, believe me, I would. I am appalled at what is going on in this great nation. And I know you are too. But I want to be very clear of this one thing as I wrap this up. God keeps His Word. God keeps His promises. Sometimes we don't understand things. And sometimes we can't see how God is going to do something. But I will give witness to this fact. God has never failed me. Not one time. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19. God is not a man that He should lie. Neither the Son of Man that He should repent. Hath He said, and shall He not do it? Or hath He spoken, and shall He not make it good? No matter how it may sound in your ears today, we have great days ahead of us. I'm talking about those of us who choose to live by the promises of God. How can I say this? Because we have these promises. They've been given to us. It's up to us to receive them, to take them to heart, to believe them, to act on them, and expect God to do what He's promised to do. Let's pray. Father, for everyone who hears me, for everyone who watches, those who listen, or those just hear the audio, take these words today and move them from any place of discouragement, any place of trouble in their heart, any place of wondering, any place of just pausing to say how, why. Move them over to what you've said, Father, as they listen to you. And may their hearts be freshened and renewed by the promises you've made to us Thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to share a very short blessing with you in just a moment. But first, let me just say thank you, thank you, thank you once again for your generosity, your tithing, your giving. You've been so faithful, even in this time when we've not had live services for a few days. And we deeply, deeply appreciate that. And so, thank you again. And I want you to know that when I pray over the offering, I mean what I'm praying. When I say to you, or you hear me say to the Lord, thank you, Father, for the another opportunity to give. It's such a blessing. Our hearts are thrilled. We're so glad to give. That's my heart. That's what I believe. That's what I want you to believe. Because giving is such a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to do. Now, after I close out with the blessing here in just a moment, there will be a message that will come up on the screen of your computer, your phone, your TV, however you have been watching this message. And it will give you the details about how you can give. And these are options we want you to know that are always, always available to you. Finally, I am excited to announce that Pastor Don and I Look forward to seeing as many of you as possibly can as you come to our facility this coming Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. It is going to be so wonderful, so good to be together once again. And now this little blessing. May God bless you. May God keep you. May He cause His face to shine upon you. And may you have rest and peace in the Lord Jesus, in His name, amen.